Sermon could be Christmas esque. It certainly can. Uh, there's one phrase towards the end of the traditional Christmas story that's read in most homes over the holidays that has always stuck out to me. It always impacts me and usually brings me to tears. After everything has happened, you know, we, we know, we, we looked at Zechariah a couple of weeks ago and the word of the Lord that came to him regarding John the Baptist. We looked at the story of Joseph uh, and what he overcame in his flesh and in his mind and submitted himself to the Lord. Mary's story is very peculiar. Um, we'll go into a little bit more depth of that next week. But after everything has happened, you know, this young girl gets this peculiar word. Uh, I say peculiar lightly. It could be uh, a life-altering word, you know, that you're going to have a child. She's a young virgin girl, and uh, she knows. She's done the math. Doesn't know how that's going to figure out. But uh, the angel says, don't fear. It's going to be from God. And, of course, her and Joseph are go to Bethlehem, and we know that story, and we know that there's no room for them in the end, and no room for Jesus, and we know that he gives them a, a place in the stable, and so Jesus is born. We know the story of the wise men, we know the story of the shepherds, and while they're watching their flocks, the angel of the Lord appears to them and gives them this fantastic news, behold, today is born to you king. And we know they went and worshiped Jesus. But in verse 19, at the end of the story of chapter 2 of Luke, they are worshiping. They've told everything that's happened. It's almost like the end, you know, of this chapter. If it was a book, it would be the end of the birth chapter, you know. And it gets to that place and Mary it says, while everybody else is doing their thing, the shepherds come, Joseph's doing what he's doing, and if he's like other husbands, uh, he's taking care of the baby, and I, I don't know what he's doing, but it says, Mary treasured these things, pondering them in her heart. Let me tell you something. Life is full of treasures. And Jenny and I have a treasure box <laughs> in our marriage, a figurative treasure box of the things that God has done for us. But let me tell you something. Usually treasures, they don't come easy. You know, even in all the old Pirates movies, you had to you had to go through the map and had to find the X and get the shovel out and dig it up, you know, and beat through the, the lock. You know, I mean, you've all seen Pirates of the Caribbean. You know how it works. Uh, <laughs> treasures are hard to get to. Treasures aren't found, even some of the most priceless treasures on the earth, they're found deep in the earth. They have to be mined for, or they have to be drilled for. You have to, they're not just sitting out there for people to take. You know, that's how treasures are, and it's how treasures are in life too. Let me tell you, before treasures come in our lives, there's always a test. And if we don't know how to walk through the test of life, then we will allow the enemy to rob from us the treasures that God's trying to give us. Mary is sitting there. Let me tell you something. That was not an easy story for her. At all. You know, as a little girl was sitting there dreaming about her life and her hunk of a man uh, that Joseph's going to be, and nobody sits down and plans it out that way. 
you know, and the difference is there. Of course, they get reconciled. Joseph was going to put her away. In other words, you're a liar. I don't believe you. Get away from me. And then God says something different to him and says, you know, actually, she's telling the truth. So she went through that. She went through, I'm guaranteeing you, people not understanding. You know, she actually went and hid herself for a while, you know, <laughs> because when you get to, she goes to her cousin Elizabeth's house and she hangs out there a while. Because when God's doing something in your life and it doesn't make sense, most people aren't going to get it. And truthfully, most people's comments are not going to help you either. Mary had a wise say, I'm, I'm just going to go hang out here. Nobody's over there at Elizabeth's. I'll just kind of hang out there for a while. And she worships the Lord over her word. And we know that it comes and comes to pass. And there she is at the end of it. Her test was turned into the greatest treasure that anybody could ever have. Can you imagine in your treasure box saying, I gave birth to and helped raise the Son of God? I actually gave physical birth to the Son of God. Now, Mary's not a deity. We don't celebrate her as, you know, as God. But she had a unique place in the history of Christianity. She had to walk through those tests to get to that treasure. And we know all along, man, she watches Jesus grow and develop into this man and into a man of God. And what a life. What a life. But what I want to talk about today is not the treasure. I mean, that's coming but the truth is, all of us know what a test is. <coughs> Few people know what a treasure is. God intends for all of those tests to turn into treasures. Amen. But man, we find ourselves in ditches all over the place. <laughs> I told you earlier, on Friday night, I was, I was sitting there in the emergency room just praying in the spirit over Damien. Um, just watching my, my brother hurt there. I mean, he's just praying like, and Shelly was playing worship music. I know that's hard for you to believe he's trying to worship you to wrap the midst of that. And he just keeps praying, God, you're worth it. God, you're worth it. I'm not going to give up. You're worth it. And that really impacted me. And the truth is, that's what life is supposed to be about when things hit us. We don't jump ship and say, okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm frustrated with this. I, I, I'm throwing in the towel. Your greatest test has the potential to be your most valuable treasure. If you learn how to walk through the test. I've got a few points on walking through the test to get to the treasure. In Acts chapter 27, you can turn your Bibles there. We see a massive storm that's going on. Paul... <laughs> This is so funny. It's not really, but Paul had this prayer and this eager desire to go to Rome. <laughs> like, I want to go to Rome. God said, okay. Goes to Jerusalem. And he goes in shackles and handcuffs on a ship. And as he's going to appeal to Caesar... It gets kind of weird. This ship just encounters a storm. I don't like storms. I like boats okay. I don't want to own one because I hear they're really expensive to maintain. But I want to borrow yours when I want to go out on the lake. <laughs> Make sure there's plenty of skis and drinks and stuff in there. Uh, I want to borrow yours. But I don't want to be caught out on the lake in a storm. So here they are out on the ocean in this storm in Acts chapter 27. And Paul does something peculiar. We're going to start reading in verse 13. Now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the nor'easter struck down from the land. I read this not too long ago. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and was driven along, running under the aisle of a small, uh, the 
lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. And after hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. And then fearing that they would run aground on surface, they lowered the gear and thus were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, that sounds like just a lot of fun. Violently storm, not storm-tossed, we're violently storm-tossed. They began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. So when neither sun nor stars for many days or no small tempest lay on us, all of our hope of being saved was at last abandoned. Now, when those type of storms hit us in life, okay, I mean we're getting violently battered by life. You ever been violently beat up by life? I mean, you feel like Evander Holyfield or when he got his ear chewed off by Mike Tyson. Like, life's just chewing me up and spitting me out. This is not, I'm sorry, that is a gross illustration. <laughs> Don't know where that came from. It wasn't in my notes. But it happens. Those things happen in life where it's just like, God, can we please just see... Any, what in the world? Why is this happening? What is this? They've thrown over the cargo. They've let go the gear. They've let go at last their hope. They have thrown everything overboard. And they're being violently storm-tossed. And verse 21 says, Since... They had been without food for a long time. To me, that would be the worst thing out of all of it. Paul stood up among them and said, You should have listened to me. Paul, don't give them the I told you so. That's so... Don't you love those people, the I told you so people? You should have listened to me. Yet now I know. I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. This very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You're going to stand before Caesar and I'm going to give you the life of every person with you. Now, let me tell you something. That's awesome. Does it mean that the sun stopped? You know, started shining and the storm was gone. No, it just continued to swirl. Beat against them. They finally threw the food overboard. That's, there would have been tears streaming down my face. As you see the snicker bars just go to the bottom of the sea there. As life is swirling, God speaks. Let me tell you something, church. The first thing that we got to do to get out of our test alive and move it to treasure is you don't need to know why it's happening. You don't need to know what it is. The correct question to ask is, God, what are you saying? Amen. See, we look for the wrong questions. We want to know why so we can be in control and fix it. God doesn't need you to fix it. He wants you to tune in to the Holy Spirit and hear what He's saying and stand on the word that He gives you. Yeah. So this storm is swirling around, man. Violently storm-tossed. They've jettisoned the cargo, the gear, the food, and even threw their hope overboard. And all of a sudden, God said, You want to hear what I'm saying now? Yes, Lord, desperately. What are you saying? <laughs> what is this? He said, take heart, bub. You prayed to go to Rome. It's coming. You're going to stand before Caesar. Don't worry. And guess what? Just as a free present to you, I'm going to give you the life of everybody with you. Now, Paul probably said, can you, can you do that all except this one guy here? He's kind of been known. So. <laughs> God speaks in the midst of the storm. Let me tell you something, guys. We need a word from the Lord. Whatever's beating against you right now, you need to know, God, what is it you're saying? See, we look for it to be removed. Like, God, take this from me. I don't like it. Now, I've 
prayed that prayer a million times because I don't have a very good threshold of pain. I don't like it. And one of the hardest things in my Christian walk that I'm having to face, and I just don't like, God seems relatively unconcerned with my comfort level. Has anybody else discovered that? It's like, God, I mean, I don't like this. You might not like it, Richie, but don't you know, want to know what I'm saying in the midst of it? I guess, God. <laughs> what are you saying? I guess. We're talking about moving our test to treasure. Getting to the place that we're, I, I'm not against asking God to remove something, if that be his will. I want to hear what God's saying in the midst of the storm. And the truth is, he's trying to speak to you right now, if we'll just open our ears and ask him. God, what are you saying? Get a word from God in the middle of the test. First thing you got to do. Where's my Bible? There it is. Turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6 because this one is really good. Get a word from the Lord. Let's be a good church and say that together. Wow. So good. 2 Kings chapter 6. Sorry I didn't have time to mark the spot, so I was taking a little longer this morning. So in 2 Kings chapter 6, we find another test, another storm swirling. <coughs> Joe, you and I were kind of talking about this the other day at the, at the hospital. It really impacted me. As you were talking about this, I, I think this is the account that you were referencing. It just stuck in my, in my spirit, and I had to look a little deeper. Once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, At such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Don't pass through this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to that place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. So here's what's going on. There's a battle going on between Syria and Israel. And the king of Syria was saying to his commanders, Hey, guys, let's go camp here. We're, we're going to be here. This is going to be our point of attack. And God kept revealing the point of attack to the man of God who would go to the king of Israel and say, hey, I just want you to know God showed me that Syria is going to be over here. And the king of Israel went and picked it out. And sure enough, there they are. So they didn't pass that way. So God kept protecting Israel through the man of God, through the word of the Lord. Now, that had to be frustrating, you know? Like, if it's like playing battleship and you know where all the ships are on the other person's place. You know, it's like, what? What in the world's going on here? I don't get this. This is so frustrating. I hate playing battleship with people that cheat. <laughs> don't you? I can direct every move I make. He knows we're making it. I don't get it. In verse 11, the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, who's the rat? Who's telling them what we're doing? Somebody find out. And one of the servants said, None, my lord, it's not us. It's Elisha. It's his fault. He's a jerk. He's ratting us out. The prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Nothing's hidden from this man. And he said, go and get him that I may send and seize him. And it was told, he's in Dothan. So he sent there the horses and chariots and a great army. And they came by night and surrounded the city. So now... Instead of going after Israel, he has sent this huge army 
after Elisha, the one who is telling the king of Israel every move that the king of Syria is making. So now there's a huge army encamped around them. And when the servant of the man of God rose, Elisha's servant, in the morning he went out and behold an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. So the servant gets up, he's making coffee. This was before Keurig. They, they had the old boiler pots, you know. Making coffee, opens the doors, you know, he's got toast in the oven, and the toaster, it's like, hey, Elisha, what do you want for breakfast? What can I oh, my goodness, there's, there's an army out there. And he goes to him and he says, alas, my master, what are we going to do? And Elisha, is everybody still with me? He says, don't be afraid. In this next phrase, man. Don't be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are against us. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. The servant looks out, he's like, there's nobody out there. <laughs> I don't know what you're seeing in this move of, now they're playing Risk, not Battleship. It's like, there's 200 armies against our one little guy here. <clears throat> he says, ah, it's nothing to worry about. And then Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, open his eyes that he can see it too. They saw something different. Same view. One guy looks out there and sees an army encamped around him. And Elisha looks out there. He's like, this is nothing. Don't worry about it. And he prays, God, open my servant's eyes because I want him to see what I'm seeing. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. <laughs> the battle's raging on. The storm's there. We've gotten a word from the Lord from Paul. The second thing we've got to do in our test, guys, we've got to get a God view of the battle. Get a, God, get a word from God, yes. But after that, we've got to get a God perspective. When things come against you, you might see nothing but a huge army and a bunch of junk just thrown your way. We need to open our eyes. What one man sees is total annihilation. Elisha looks out there at the same view. He says, no, those that are with us are a lot greater than those that are with them. I used to see horses and chariots, but all around them, I see chariots of fire and horses on fire all around them. We got nothing to worry about. That's the thing about test. They will lie to you and diminish who God is to you. Amen. They will look at you in the face and say, your God's nothing. Look at this. Look at our army. We're coming against you. You can't do anything. We're taking you out. And that's where the song was written, actually. Remember we sang earlier, Elisha looks out the window and he says, this is how I fight my battle. <laughs> Just looks out the window. I'm like, oh, we got nothing to worry about, God. <laughs> it may look like I'm surrounded, but no. <laughs> I don't think so. Guys, in your test, you need a God perspective. Don't let your test tell you who God is. That's such a lie of Satan. God can't be diminished. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And a test does not take away from his goodness. It doesn't take away from who he is. We need a God perspective. If we're ever going to get to treasure and get out of the mess of the test, we got to get a God perspective of the battle. Because we're never going to make it through the test 
if all we see is what's coming against us. Open our eyes, oh God. Praise the Lord. The third thing I would say is this, guys. Uh, obey whatever God tells you to do in the storm. God uses everything, and I've said this a lot, he never wastes a hurt. He never wastes a trial or a test. Don't stand against what's going on. You know, our first thing is, God, what, is you, what are you saying in this? Or, you know, what, what are you saying? There's always something for us to do, too. Life is about obedience to what he's calling us to do. you believe that? He's speaking something to you right now. Do it. Be obedient to the voice of God in the midst of your trial. Fourth thing I would say is this. I, I'm looking at the time and I'm trying to wrap it up quickly. Because I feel like we're supposed to worship some more. Say, get a word from the Lord. Get a God view of the battle. Obey your purpose. God purpose in the storm. <laughs> See, you got it right. I messed it up. <clears throat> Keep yourself humble and moldable. Thank you, Jenny, but you didn't have to say that. Simon didn't say. No, I'm just kidding. Here's what else we do in storms. You've been there as well as I have. In the test... One of the other tactics of the enemy, other than diminishing our God, is to make us bitter and to make us hard. We fight against it constantly. Anybody else, or is this just me? Am I just bearing my scars here? It's like when stuff happens, you know, and especially in a storm that's been going and going and going, my heart hardens to it so I don't have to deal with it. There's times that it's best not to look at that, and I'll just be bitter about that situation because that helps me exist and go on. Is that too real? <laughs> God wants us to stay humble and moldable even in the midst of the most intense things that hurts like the Dickens. Dickens, see, it is a Christmas sermon. <laughs> wow! Christmas-esque. The struggle, though, is to guard your own heart. Man, fight that with everything inside of you. Can you imagine if Mary walked through that whole thing? Like, God, I didn't ask for this. Joseph's mad at me. He doesn't believe me. Forget this. God, nobody believes what I'm saying. God, why? Why is this happening? Stay humble and moldable. And in the midst of storms, just keep your heart pliable in the hands of the potter. I say, you know what, I, don't, I, don't, I know this hurts right here. It hurts when I go on the fire here, but I'm going to take this out. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to mold and shape you into who I want you to be. At some point, we just get like Play-Doh that's been left out for a couple months, and you go to play, and it just crumbles. Yes, I still like to play with Play-Doh. <laughs> <laughs> it just crumbles. And then you just need the oil of the Spirit, man. Get in that heart, my God. Created me a clean heart, oh God. And renew a right spirit within me, Lord. My heart's hardened and it hasn't been right, but I don't like that. I, I give it to you again, Lord. Keep your heart moldable and humble before the Lord. The last thing, and I know you're getting excited because the Cowboys are playing in 30 minutes. <laughs> I heard one amen. And for that, I want to say thank you. I think it was Dennis Whitten. <laughs> the, the last thing that I would say in turning your test to the treasure, we find in Romans chapter 5, and I have led, ooh, ooh, that is not a word, leaned, I was going to say lend, 
no, that's not it, leaned on this verse many times in my life. And I just want to read it to you. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. It says, more than that, we rejoice in our suffering. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. The fifth thing is endure. Get a word from the Lord. Get a God perspective of the battle. Obey whatever it is He's telling you to do. Keep yourself, guard your own heart. Keep yourself humble and moldable. And just endure. Sometimes that's hard. I've never found endurance easy. I used to be a runner. I still consider myself a runner. My body doesn't consider myself a runner anymore, but I still consider myself a runner. It's hard to endure. It's hard to press through. But man, it's so important. If you do these things, I promise you, that test is going to become a treasure. When everybody else is just sitting around, they're worshiping, doing their thing. You're treasuring up in your life what God has done. One of my old favorite songs, I used to listen to this all the time from C.C. Wine, is you don't know the cost of the oil in an alabaster box. I love that song. I would try to sing it, but it would be embarrassing because she's so good at it. Listen to that song. That's what life is about. Storing up treasures Walking through test after test from faith to faith. Walking through life and moving from test to treasure. And getting this box of all these God moments in your life for one purpose. To open it up and say, Jesus, now I just worship you with all these treasures that you've bestowed upon me. God, I realize that it's all for you. And you open that up. That's one thing you'll never see me do. It gets funny at times. But if somebody's worshiping the Lord, you have no clue what treasure they're unleashing on Jesus. What wine they're pouring on Him. What oil they're pouring on Him. You have no idea what they walk through. I mean, it's easy to say, look at that. What in the world is that? <laughs> You get to the place and say, God, I don't care. It's yours, Lord. You've done this. You've done this, Lord. And all these things you've done in my life, I just want to lavish them on you, God, because that's who you are. You're worthy of them, Lord. Lord, there's a lot of tests going on in this building. There's a lot of trials. There's a lot of storms. A lot of hardship, Lord. It's a lot of difficulty. A lot of pain. A lot of frustration. A lot of disillusionment. What are you saying, God? I just need to hear you speak. We need to hear you speak. this question first. Who's looking out the window and all you see is what's coming against you and you've lost that God perspective of the battle. You, you don't see the good. You, you don't see the chariots of fire and the horses on fire surrounding what's coming against you. All you see is the attack and honestly it just keeps pushing you down and down and down and down and you know that you're not in this place by accident. And you know that God's speaking to you right now. If that's you, I, I want to pray for you.